All right, I'm Tom Moore from the Bar Tips Lab. And in this video, I'm gonna be focusing on cheeky ones. Now, what do I mean by a cheeky one? A cheeky one is essentially an illegal technique from boxing. And we're gonna look at things that kind of exist on the cusp of untoward, unacceptable or illegal in the ring, how they work, what people do, and then how can we take that and manifest that in boxing for self-defense, self-protection. Because bear in mind an important facet, the things that are illegal in boxing that are common, let you know that these are things that can be done under extreme stress with extremely good opponents and extreme risk. So you know that if a dirty technique is done in boxing or another combat sport, you know it's got great efficacy because people are doing it for a competitive advantage. And if you fuck up, you wake up unconscious. So we're gonna look at some cheeky ones, some dirty little techniques, some fun little things to think about. I'm gonna do them gloved and then I'll recap on gloved and I'll try and be brief and quick. So first of all, very, very simple, modern gloves, have a small attachment for the thumb, which means it's not as articulated as a historical glove. But in either instance, the thumb portion of the glove is typically pointed, it's typically, it comes to a sharper end than the broad mass of the glove, which means you can use this thumb in a couple of little nefarious ways. Thumbing. So, if you're boxing at range out here, and you want to damage a bit of vision, you want to cause a bit of eye trauma, you might decide to think thumb first on the shot, especially on the jab. So you're kind of twisting out this shot and driving the thumb towards the eye. And again, it's not something you do in a legit boxing match, but people do it and it works. So it's something we can learn and bring into self-protection boxing. So you've got long range thumbing from here, and you've got short range thumbing where you might be in a tangle you might use the thumb to push off against the head. So for all intensive purposes, you're shoving off the opponent. That trauma or that damage to the eye and that give, allows me that space following which you can fill that gap with violence. So long range thumbing and short range thumbing are some of the ways in which you can cause trauma and land strategically with the nasty bit of the glove. Another important skill set is being able to push and shove appropriately. A couple of uses for pushing. First one, I'm going to use my left hand again. I'm going to shove hard against the shoulder. And the idea is to turn the opponent's torso. When we're boxing, we tend to protect our face and we tend to protect our important organs, our liver, our spleen, our heart, like so. So whether we're fully shelled up or traditional or peekaboo or whatever the fuck, we don't tend to look after our shoulders. So they make a pretty good target opportunity. So again, we're moving around here. You can pop out this shove at the shoulder and that will turn the opponent somewhat, exposing a good bit of jaw for something else. And you can start to build this into your one-two rhythm. Bang, bang. So push to turn, then strike what's exposed. That's one use of the push and shove. Another use of the push and shove is as a shoulder stop. So if you imagine, my left hand correlates to his right shoulder. For most people, their right shot is the shot you need to worry about. So what you might decide to do, either proactively, before you need it, or reactively, as you need it, you might start to jam the hard bit of your palm <coughs> against that shoulder. It's gonna hurt, it's gonna disrupt any punch that he's starting to throw. If you get someone to shove your right shoulder as you try and throw a shot, really just fucks it, neuters that shot entirely. So you can do it, if you're worried about his right hand, <coughs> you can start to just mash this up and it will look like a jab for all intents and purposes. So you've got that as a shoulder stop. So you can do it before the punches come, you could be moving, <coughs> cheekily jam that in there, it's jarring, it hurts, it's disruptive, it damages that part of the body. I'm just gonna wiggle this so it doesn't go on screensaver. Or you've got the option to push to turn the opponent, giving you room to fire in that shot. When it comes to pulling, it's easier to show you with something that has arms. So next time I'm boxing, I'll film that for you. But in essence, if you can compress an opponent, if you can compress their guard with the force of your body, if you go in this motion, you can pull and drag a guard away. 
Make sure you fill, when you make a gap, fill it immediately with violence. Don't pull and mar your handiwork and hit ta ta that have recentered their hands. So you are pulling and hitting at the same time. Pull and hit, pull and hit. That's up top if you've compressed them in a high guard. Some people might have a lower guard, in which case you compress and then you scoop this way. Make sure you use your hip to scoop and again, make the gap, fill it with violence. Make the gap, fill it with violence. So compress, very important principle. Make a gap, fill it with violence. So that's some of the ways you can push to stop, push to damage, push to turn, compress, pull to make space, pull to make space. Other things you might want to consider is sound. Uh, my boxing coach, Gavin Conway, shout out to you, is an absolute fucking nutter. And one of the things he likes to do is when you're in the clinch or when you're up close, he'll make the sound of biting your ear off and go, Rah! I know he's not going to bite my ear off, but it still makes you fucking move. It makes you react weirdly in clinches. It might stop you striking when you otherwise might have done. So obviously you could, if you wished, bite and rip and do all that sort of nasty stuff if you're thinking about boxing for the street. But even just the auditory sound of it, the threat of it, Rah! will make you move, will disrupt you, will stun you, will make you act in an unorthodox way. And again, you make the space, Rah! that might make you move, you fill the gap with violence straight away. Nice little thing to do. You've got cheeky hooks to elbows. And I say elbows, typically these land on the pre-elbow element here. So you're essentially pulling in a hook closer than it would naturally be. So if you're going up top to the head, you would pull. Imagine you're gonna punch yourself in the opposite shoulder and you're gonna smash with this here. And again, you can't think of these like the stopping power of a Thai elbow. It's not gonna have that level of force because you're not really gonna be able to pull off being able to hit with the point of the elbow. The whole point is to make a space and fill it with violence. <coughs> People react to unfamiliar stimuli differently. You get jabbed in the face all day. How many bits of forearm do you cop in the face all day? So again, you're moving up close. Yep. <coughs> that small <coughs> little gap where you go, fuck, what was that? That moving of your head might give me all the space I need <coughs> to land something else. These also work pretty good to the body. Try them on the heavy bag. So you redact in the hook and you smash in the forearm. Now sometimes they can skim and guide, like kind of glide off the body. Sometimes you might just fully redact it in anyway, as if they had moved. So again, if you think about, if you want to pull off this cheeky kind of hook elbow, it's you can punch yourself in the shoulder or punch yourself in the ribs or the hips. Either way, that gives you that short, sharp arc <coughs> to land that shot. But bear in mind, it's not going to be a full fight ender. <coughs> so it's going to be a little bit of a space maker to fire in something nasty elsewhere. Secondary wiggle of the mass. Okay. I much prefer lace ups, but they'll take a lot longer to put on in the video. Other things we can look at, palming and posting. Now posting is essentially the act of extending the arm. Some people do it pre-contact, so they'll have the arm out and it'll just be an annoyance, it'll be an inconvenience, it'll disrupt your range, maybe your vision. It might just anger you because it's so fucking annoying. So when you're doing that, you can be like a wasp in a car, you know, you just, rawr, rawr, just get all fucking up in his grill with his hand. Make sure you're being tricksy with it. It moves, it withdraws, it comes back, moves, withdraws, with back, kind of covers his vision. You don't want to be covering his math. You haven't done much there. Cover his vision, cover his vision, cover his vision, move it, redact it, because he will push, pull, move, punch, and otherwise manipulate himself or that arm to get it out of the way to come at you. But you can do it as an annoyance, as a stall, as a range keeper. So if you've got a long, straight shot, if you're in the mid range and you don't quite like it, you might keep this post up boom, so you can land your shocks. It gives you that runway. Think of it like a laser targeting system. I pointed the laser, bam, fired the shot. Useful tool to have. You can also have this as a contact on face. 
you'll get disqualified or you get warned pretty early for this. Whereas for this you won't, it's just an annoyance. But if you're talking about illegal moves for boxing for self-defense, just having something gripping or mauling or in his face might give you the cover you need to step off, bam, bam, move around his back, step up, hit the things that you shouldn't normally be hitting, the kidneys, the back of the head. So you've got contact posting, you've got kind of dynamic posting, moving, moving, moving. And you've also got close range posting in it. You get close and you might decide to post off to again, give yourself that room. Quite a nice one is to post off the head, hit the body. You do it really fast. No one really knows the difference between a jab. <laughs> Another great thing is obviously if you're posting, you're using the thin, least padded part of the glove to cause some damage. Other things that you can consider. Shoulder popping. So if you end up up close, let's say I've ended up here. And I know that my right hand is my best shot in this instance. So I've ended up with the wrong shoulder and I've got pressure on him. If I go bang, if I drop this shoulder in now and I do it percussively, it's going to cause some damage. It might wind him if I land it in the solar plexus or against the liver or the spleen or wherever I jam that in. So use it with proper torque. So I've got one shoulder, I'm pushing him against the corner. Wham! I've smashed in that other shoulder now to free up my right hand. So I can do other shit. So you've got clinch shoulder bashes, where you want to move. You want to move so you can free up your desired hand for the desired shot. So that's you pushing him against the corner. You may decide if you shoulder roll. So if you take something on the shoulder, you may decide to launch back out this way. So you may take something on the shoulder, compress, and then move so you free up your hand. So ultra close range, they work best if you bend the knees so you've got a lower base and you can jam those in. And they can come in, or if you're markedly smaller, up. Up also works well. I rarely do up because I'm quite a tall guy, but again, you've got this option of shoulder roll, bang! I've driven this up, and then I might drive it in. Oh! Nice ways to dig in those nasty little shoulder shots. And if you've got parity of height, you can use your shoulder to move his shoulders around so you can manipulate his body with your shoulder. Cursory wiggle. All right. So shoulder popping, a great way to benefit from this or get used to it is to do what I call shoulder wrestling. So you get to a point where your hands are tight behind your back and you have to get used to using and manipulating your body via your shoulders to move, to strike, to position someone where you want them. It's a great way to get used to using your shoulder as a tactile tool, a wrestling tool, or a striking tool. Obviously, if you're looking at cheats and fouls and how they translate from boxing into street self-defense boxing, you'd be remiss not to think about target selection. I won't spend much time on it here, but if you imagine if you can land a jab to the jaw, you can land a jab to the throat. If you can land an uppercut to the midsection, you can land an uppercut to the groin. If you can land a hook to the liver or spleen, you can land a hook to the kidneys. If you can land a hook to the head, you can land a rabbit punch to the back of the head. So you've got all of these new targets. So don't forget to be creative with how you hit and also from where you hit. Can I land a solid hook from seated? Can I land a solid hook from a bar stool? Can I land a solid hook from one knee right into your femoral artery? And then come up with an uppercut. You know, change your position relative to the opponent and your environment. Yeah. Can I do this when I'm compressed and in a crowd? These are all things you need to think about, but shot placement, just get creative. Throat, groin, kidneys, back of the head. You know, there are varying degrees of force there that you'd want to consider, but they're all available to you without having to tweak much other than your targeting. But do get used to accurate placement with these tools, that's very, very important. Head wrestling is a key part 
So you've got head butts, and I've got videos covering head butts, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. But in essence, I treat them like a sneeze. So I launch it from the back, be explosive. Everyone knows how to sneeze. So choo, and you bang in, choo, bam. Because your body knows how to sneeze, it comes with all the right acceleration and body drop. Choo, bam. You know what you're doing. But you've got two breeds of headbutt. You've essentially got a downwards headbutt, bang, straight on the target. Or if you're a bit smaller, like an upward driving headbutt. Either way, you want to be using the front hard portions of the skull. Bam, bam. And you want to do it explosively like a sneeze. Choo, bam, headbutts. But I've got stuff on that already. Other things you want to consider is the ability to use their head to wrestle and manipulate the opponent. So if I want to free up my right hand, I'm going to push my head to the left. If I push my head to the left, that means my right hand's now free. So as opposed to here, if I wiggle and grind my head in and push it to the left, I've now freed up my right hand and make a space and then fill it with violence. <coughs> So important things to consider, make a space, fill it with violence. It's very, very, very important. So I might use it to drive his head back to make a bit of space and then fade off on an uppercut. You might move them to the left or the right to again fire in that hook or whatever you want to do. So head wrestling, a bit like I said about the shoulder wrestling. As soon as you're doing shoulder wrestling, you get used to striking and manipulating a person. You get used to just using your head as if you were a bloody bully goat. Can I move and manipulate a person where I want them to go with my head? That's an important skill. Make a space for it with violence. And also, could I potentially in a street scenario go from that into explosive use of the head? But again, another thing to think about. Just going to cursory wiggle. Then you've got your forearm bracing or framing. So this is where we've come to a kind of collapsed position where we're grappling, we're wrestling, we're, we're, we're stand-up grappling. Things that you might want to consider is how to use your forearm as a bracing shield to give you the space, create space. Fill it with violence. Exactly, fill it with violence. So we're here, I've created a bit of space. Notice how I'm having my arm like this, greater than 90 degrees. If this was a door, and behind that door was a mad axeman, and I'm holding that door closed, that's how I'm going to hold the door. Yeah, I'm going to put as much force as I can into it. it. Gives me structural strength. So again, if we're here, I'm going to frame, and I'm going to use that moment in time, the space, and I'll fill it with violence. So from here, frame, back to frame, back to frame. Back to frame. Getting used to being able to frame at the chest, potentially up kind of towards the face area, but really this T area, along the shoulders and down the center line, that makes a really good area to frame, make a space, fill in violence. Back to that frame. You may change frames. Fill it with violence. Things to consider. So framing and forearm basic. Think like a Spartan. And finally, just going to do another cursory wiggle of this mess. Finally, you'd also want to consider cuffing. So again, this is all padded and lovely. This is not padded and lovely. The inner wrist, the bony part of the wrist, is actually a pretty good striking surface. You don't want to be slapping per se. You don't want to be slapping with your palm. You want to be slapping with your wrist. So the old school guides you'd see things like cuffing. So as opposed to a tight hook, you're gonna land in with the inner part of your wrist, not your hand, your wrist. These are one of those things where you have to feel the difference between, I'm just gonna pull this shirt out. You'll have to feel the difference between being hit with the glove and the wrist for you to fully appreciate it. So you're throwing it exactly like a hook, but the last minute, you're cuffing. You're using that inner wrist, and you're smashing it along the jawbone, orbital bone, wherever the fuck you're gonna put it. So it's an important skill to have, being able to slap and cuff. It's important to not just think in terms of slapping. I'm not using the open hand, I'm using the wrist. 
they work quite well to the body too. So people might see something that looks like a slappy fighter, but if you start to cop it with the inner part of the glove, you'll soon feel the effect of those shots. So there's a couple of cheeky ones there for you to play with. Just gonna de-glove. You've got to be able to pull these things off gloved. So if you're consensually training with a partner, let's say you do normal boxing or your boxing's part of your training, you're like, look, we're gonna focus on boxing fouls. Start with the gloves. See, start slow, start gentle, start accurate. Can I do it with the gloves on? As soon as you can do that, then you can start to kind of drill it and slow it down and move it into ungloved situations for boxing for self-defense. So just to reiterate the ones we talked about, thumbing. I can jam that thumb right to the eye. Pow, pow, with the same speed as the jab. Nice and simple. Pow, pow, pow. It looks like a slap on CCTV. Pow, get that thumb right in there. Up close, I can thumb to make space. Pow, pow, pow. Thumb to make space, firing that shot. Pushing and pulling is exactly the same. So push to turn, push to stop, okay, you get the idea. Sounds, gloved or ungloved, or actually if I can bite the thing, but you gotta sell it with all good feints. If you're not gonna do the move, you still gotta sell the move. Hooks to elbows, exactly the same. Remember, punch at your own shoulder or at your own torso and they work pretty good against the body. <laughs> nice and simple. Palming and posting. Yep. Post off the face. Reposition where you are while your hand's just gripping a lump of face. <laughs> Slam something in. <laughs> Jamming something up into that face, stepping off, smashing into the jaw. Lovely little thing to do. Shoulder pops, as per. Make space, fill it with violence. Nice and simple. Your shot placement, you can be even more accurate ungloved, which is really cool, so you can get used to, if I could have popped that jab to the jaw, how does it feel against the throat? How does this feel against the kidney? How does this feel against the back of the head? How does this feel against the groin? You gotta get used to using your knuckles as the tool and not the glove itself. Very important. As with the head wrestling, it's an important exercise, head and shoulder wrestling. Your forearm bracing. Smash it right in there, greater than 90 degrees. Make a space, fill it with violence. Bam, bam. Jobs are good. Un. And you're slapping and cuffing. Your inner wrist actually makes a really good striking tool. So you might post up top with a palm, then move into a cuff. Bam, bam. And then you might dig into your normal boxing. Those are a couple of little cheeky ones for you to play with at home. Do experiment with them, explore them. I did say it'd be a short video. That was a lie. Go practice, go experiment. Let me know how it goes. Cheeky ones from boxing.